Supposed Bible Contradiction When did Jesus appear before the women? The Gospel of Matthew says that on Sunday morning, the women discovered the empty tomb, and then were told by angels that Jesus rose from the dead, and so they ran back to tell the disciples. The text seems to indicate that on the way, Jesus appeared to them and told the women to tell the disciples to go to Galilee. However, in John's Gospel, the women discover the empty tomb and run back to tell the disciples. Then the text records that Peter, John, and Mary Magdalene went back to the tomb. Peter and John leave, and the angels speak with Mary, and then Jesus appears to her. Skeptics will note these two accounts do not chronologically line up and contradict each other in multiple ways. Some Christians respond by trying to harmonize the accounts in a way that preserves all the chronological aspects in both Gospels. Perhaps what happened is the women went to the tomb and found it empty. Mary Magdalene was so distraught, she ran ahead to the disciples, leaving the other women behind. Then the angels appeared to the other women that remained behind, and then they went to deliver the message to the disciples. On the way back, Jesus appeared to them. Meanwhile, Mary, John, and Peter ran to the tomb but took a different way, thereby missing the other women who were looking for the disciples. Then Peter and John left, and the angels and Jesus appeared to Mary alone. This is one possible way to harmonize the accounts, but it is complex and unnecessary. Mike Lacona suggests a simpler explanation, namely that the Synoptic Gospels have compressed and conflated elements to make the narrative more understandable for their audience. As we noted in other videos in this series, ancient authors were not bound by modern rules of writing. Like Kona notes, ancient authors utilized a number of liberties when writing ancient historical texts. He says, classical scholars have recognized a number of compositional devices that are practically universal in ancient historiography. Some of these devices are transferal, when an author knowingly attributes words or deeds to a person that actually belong to another person, the author has transferred the words or deeds. Displacement, when an author knowingly uproots an event from its original context and transplants it in another, the author has displaced the event. Displacement has some similarities with telescoping, which is the presentation of an event as having occurred either earlier or more recently than it actually occurred. Plutarch displaces events and even occasionally informs us he has done so. Conflation, when an author combines elements from two or more events or people and narrates them as one, the author has conflated them. Accordingly, some displacement and or transferal will always occur in the conflation of stories. Compression, when an author knowingly portrays events over a shorter period of time than the actual time it took for those events to occur, the author has compressed the story. Simplification, when an author adapts material by omitting or altering details that may complicate the overall narrative, the author has simplified the story. The point being ancient authors utilize more liberties when writing down historical accounts. They could reorganize events, modify the chronological order, transfer the words of someone to another, and combine events into one. This does not mean, though, that an author was free to invent entire stories and pass them off as history. They still had to report historical events, but could do so with these compositional devices in mind. J.L. Moles says, If the historian exercises some restraint in the bending of the facts, the procedure is legitimate enough in itself, and perhaps even, to some degree, and in one form or another, inevitable if historiography is to contribute to any real understanding of human affairs. Admittedly, Plutarch puts a lower priority on the initial establishment of the facts than some ancient historians proper, though a higher priority than others. But on the other hand, his manipulation of the facts does not permit invention from nothing. He is therefore a liar, only if truth be held to consist solely in precise historical truth. In other words, ancient authors could rework events, simplify and compress stories, but authors like Plutarch were unlikely to invent entire episodes out of thin air. For example, Suetonius and Cassius Dio say that Julius Caesar reflected on the life of Alexander the Great when he was in front of a statue of him. But Plutarch says Caesar did this when reading about Alexander as he was approaching the ocean. Caesar 
probably did such a thing, but either Plutarch or Suetonius and Cassius Dio simply displaced the event to help with the narrative flow. Christopher Pelling also notes Plutarch likely dated this episode to a later time period to better suit his narrative flow, as it better fit at the time when Caesar's ambitions became central. Plutarch also displays quotes and events. In Life of Sertorius, Sertorius makes a sarcastic statement about Pompey and Metellus after a battle, but in Life of Pompey, he utters it after learning that Pompey arrived in Spain and before the battle. Instead of Sertorius making the statement twice, it is likely Plutarch displaced the event to help with his narrative flow. In Life of Pompey and Life of Caesar, the first agrarian law was proposed prior to Caesar giving his daughter in marriage to Pompey. But in Life of Cato Minor, the marriage preceded the introduction of the agrarian law. Craig Keener conducted a study by comparing the life and suicide of Otho in the works of Suetonius, Tacitus, and Plutarch, and notes there are several differences with regards to the order of events and how things play out in each account. For example, the sequence of information in our sources differs, sometimes in a manner that affects how we understand the events. Thus, did Otho order quick engagement before or after his initial victories? Since both writers consider his choice rash in retrospect, one might argue that Tacitus rearranged the events to reinforce this point, but given Tacitus' enormous detail and sequencing of the material, and the fact that Suetonius merely summarizes various points here, Tacitus surely preserves the original sequence. Keener also notes that Suetonius likely condensed the story in multiple places because his elite readers would have already been familiar with the story. The three authors also contradict in multiple ways, and sometimes an author reports an event that the other two miss or only allude to. But this doesn't mean the account of Otho was fiction or constructed whole cloth. There most likely was a real Otho who was emperor for three months and committed suicide. Historians also do not suggest the accounts of Otho cannot be trusted because they contradict at times. Instead, they often work with the accounts, applying the principle of charity, to reconstruct a chronology and infer when events only mentioned in one account most likely happened in the sequence. Mere contradictions between different accounts does not mean the story is fiction or unreliable. If that was the case, we would have to doubt Hannibal's crossing of the Alps, the assassination of Julius Caesar, and Nero's burning of Rome. In fact, in non-Western and ancient cultures, chronological sequence is not as important when passing on a story. Events are often out of order. What mattered to the ancient audience was the narrative flow in that the events were structured in a coherent fashion. Richards and O'Brien say, In the non-Western world, stories often circulate around the event until it coalesces, therefore orderliness but not the chronological sequence is important. Unfortunately for us, the events in the Bible are not necessarily presented in historical, chronological order. A lot of skeptics and fundamentalists assume if the Gospels were not written in chronological order, they must be in error. But this is applying a standard from our cultural expectations. The ancient world cared far less about chronological order and cared more about sequencing events into a story that followed certain themes. Mark, for example, places the episode of Jesus cleansing the temple in the middle of the account of him cursing the fig tree. The likely reason is to make a comparison between the tree and the temple, as neither was bearing good fruit. Luke organizes based on references to the temple. So when Jesus is tempted by Satan, it makes sense to place that temptation last, instead of second, as in Matthew. Matthew, on the other hand, transports major events of Jesus' life to mountains. Since he is organizing around that theme, it makes sense for him to place the temptation on the mountain last. Chronological order was not important. What was important was the message and narrative flow. So when it comes to the different sequences in the Gospels, it is likely that either John or Matthew is displacing the appearance to the women to fit each Gospel's narrative flow. John is spotlighting Mary Magdalene and possibly decided to place the appearance of the women after John and Peter went to the tomb. Lycona suggests Matthew and the other two synoptics are likely the ones compressing the events that unfolded on Sunday morning. Matthew has likely compressed the events of the morning and simplified the account. And on the other hand, 
John reports less of the message from the angels. Matthew is compressed elsewhere when he narrates the centurion going to Jesus and petitioning him to heal his servant rather than sending two separate sets of emissaries while never seeing Jesus himself as in Luke. However, if the resurrection narratives in the synoptics have not been conflated and greatly compressed, why is the initial appearance of the angels to the women absent in John? If Matthew and the synoptics conflated and compressed elements in the narrative, of necessity, they would have needed to redact other elements in order to improve the flow of the narrative. As we have noted in previous videos, leaving out details another author mentions is not necessarily a contradiction. Each author likely highlighted the parts of the account they saw fit to construct their narrative flow. Matthew has probably compressed the events of the day, and John probably decided to explain what happened in more detail, but also decided to focus on other important instructions given by Jesus and the angels. Thus, when we study the Gospels in their cultural context, this contradiction is better understood and resolved. <laughs>